about PETA animal testing and Elle Woods, Bruiser Woods as my idol. Diva! <laughs> Hopefully everyone just enjoyed my second oldest dog's intro for you. She would not get off of the chair. So I was like, well, then you can be the host for like 20 seconds. Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to my channel. You know what, I do have, of course, the Ghost Adventures review because it would not be a weekend without my Ghost Adventures review. And I was really surprisingly impressed by what happened last weekend. So Ghost Adventures this week took place at the Viper Room, which is in LA off of Sunset. And this is the famous location or club where River Phoenix died in 1993. Now, if you're not familiar with River Phoenix, he is Joaquin Phoenix's little brother. He was in some movies like Stand By Me and even Indiana Jones. Now, when he died in 1993, he was actually at the prime, basically, of his career. He was only 23 years old. Another thing that I thought was interesting that I was shocked Ghost Adventures didn't point out was River Phoenix actually died in the club on Halloween of 1993. So could that be another reason why he's maybe unrested? It's a very interesting possibility, right? So River Phoenix did die of a drug overdose and he did appear in over 24 films. So he had a huge career at such a young age. He was actually known as an 80s teen idol. So all of the 80s girls that grew up as teens in the 80s they definitely knew who River Phoenix was. So basically the death of River Phoenix, how it kind of unfolded was the night of October 30th, he was partying really hard inside of the Viper Room. The night had ended and it turned into morning. So the morning hours of basically Halloween or maybe afternoon hours of Halloween, he went outside of the Viper Room and Joaquin Phoenix was there along with their sister Rain. At some point, River Phoenix actually collapsed on the sidewalk in front of the Viper Room on Halloween and started having seizures. Joaquin Phoenix went to call 911 while their sister Rain tried to attempt to give him CPR. Unfortunately, the CPR did not work. He was taken to the local hospital where he later died on Halloween, 1993. I just felt like this was an important fact, you know, where his death occurred, because I know that there's a lot of rumors with the secret room and possibly with one of the owners being buried back in the dirt. But I just wanted to make it clear that River Phoenix did not die in that room. So when this Viper Room was actually owned by Johnny Depp, there was a lot of interesting, you know, kind of myths surrounding what was happening to the missing funds of the Viper Room, and no one really knew who to blame or how to blame them. With the other owner, Anthony Fox, that had gone missing, his death still hasn't been determined or even, or should I say, he hasn't even been determined dead just missing. It surrounded a lot of controversy around Johnny Depp, who has always been a huge actor since he was very young. So I think in order to remove himself from the controversy, in the hopes of saving his career, he had to sell the Viper Room and get away from it so that he could continue his career path. Who knows if Johnny Depp was actually involved with the missing person case of Anthony Fox. No one really knows. I thought it was really compelling that Rita, the girl that claims that she has the female attachment in the basement of the Viper Room that she claimed she was getting text messages from an entity there. 
although I was disappointed we couldn't see pictures of it or if she had an iPhone at the time, did she take a snapshot of it, you know, but that is compelling. I just wish we could have actually seen the evidence. But I have to say that I was so proud of Zach for saying, you know, it's such a compelling piece of evidence because what we say is we're collecting data from electromagnetic fields, which we know phones can output low minor EMFs. But Zach did compare the two, stating that a phone could definitely be a source of energy for the entities to interact with. So I was so proud of Zach for pointing that out. So they had some sort of inclination while they were talking to Rita to use the thermo cam, I think it was just a regular flare cam, along with a PSB7 spirit box to see if they could get any kind of communication going during the actual interview with Rita. I thought this was so great, guys. Like, I was so proud of Ghost Adventures for this because I myself have been in the middle of an interview and while you're doing the interview, you start hearing things and you start gathering evidence. So for them to have, you know, access to ghost gear at that exact moment, I couldn't have been more proud because I have actually caught some of my most compelling pieces of evidence during the interview and I have a theory behind this. My theory is, is that entities don't like to be called dead. They don't like to not be a part of the conversation. In my research, when I have gone to do investigations, I have found that they just want to be a part of the conversation too, which is why most of the time, if you actually listen or try to gather evidence while you're doing an interview, you can actually get some of your best pieces of evidence during the interview process. And I know that it's not what you anticipate, it's not what you expect. You need to be focused on the interview, yes, so that you can have accurate facts and data collection and eyewitness accounts for later. But honestly, it's almost like the entities know these people that are involved, like in this case it was Rita who works in the basement of the Viper Room, and it wanted to be around Rita while she was being interviewed by Zach. So this was a prime time for them to try to gather evidence. No, they didn't catch anything, but I was so proud. It was a great attempt, and this is a lesson to you guys that even when you're doing interviews, if you have a backup investigator in your team, try to have them close by with a couple pieces of gear. You don't need to do a full-blown investigation. Just have them ready if you think that you're about to collect some sort of evidence for your data collection. I was so proud of this because with all of the fake paranormal shows that are out there right now, I feel like right now, more than ever, this time more than ever, it is so important to have real accurate evidence and this proves to me, once again, that Ghost Adventures, you know, isn't faking it because they were showing we didn't capture any evidence. We were hoping we would because we had an energy change in the atmosphere we could physically sense. So we pulled out some gear, but we didn't collect anything, but at least we tried. That is authentic and being real, and it is more important now than ever for them to show no evidence versus a bunch of fake evidence. Now the next thing that I thought was crazy was the actual manager of the Viper Room, what, or was he the owner? I couldn't really tell if it was a manager and a manager or a manager and an owner. Anyway, they showed the actual footage of all of the people falling down in the exact same spot by the bar over and over again. Obviously you could tell this wasn't just like friends hanging out at the Viper Room or the bar, this was actually customers that were hanging out at the bar. And he even said sometimes if people walk up to the same place over and over again, they'll just continue to fall for absolutely no reason, almost black out. Why did I think this was so great and I was so proud that Ghost Adventures got the footage to show us? Could this be actual evidence and evidentiary support of a portal existing? Because that's really what it could be. If it's in the exact same spot and everybody, even the same person or different people in the same spot, everybody that goes to that same spot continues to fall and almost pass out in the exact same manner, it wouldn't just be energy of like an entity. This would be a full on portal at this location. So I was just so taken back when I saw that footage of these random customers falling. That potentially could be 
proof and evidence of an actual portal existing that we have never seen before as investigators. Now the guy that I'm talking about, the one that had like kind of curly hair, like I said, I couldn't tell if he was like a manager or, a, or the actual owner, but he said in 16 years, he will not go back into the hole or that room. So I thought that was really crazy. So he didn't really give an explanation. He said he's not really a total non-believer, but he's not really a believer, but he thinks something else exists. So that is really compelling that in 16 years, he's worked there probably any time during the day and any time at night that he still refuses to go back into the hole. So there must be some sort of really strange energy going on back there. This was actually a really comical ghost adventures, I thought, like I laughed a lot. One of the most funny parts I, I personally witnessed was, they, Billy has his MacBook and he has the sticker covered up because Technically, they're not sponsored by Apple, so he can't show the Apple insignia or logo, you know, on television unless they are actually approved for sponsorship, right? Now, talking about the actual EVPs they captured. So Rita sat down to actually listen to the EVPs that they captured through the spirit box. So she called out the one that said River Phoenix. And at first I didn't hear it either, but when she pointed it out, I was like, wow, that is really crazy. You know what I mean? And then the second one they captured, which they had already determined what it said. It was a sentence, I get confused. So it is really sad to think River Phoenix probably did die of an overdose and maybe he didn't know he was dead when you are that lucid, you know, when you're almost in a lucid state of mind from the drugs and then you die and then you wake up later, you don't know if you're not in your physical self. So that's really sad that maybe he didn't realize that he was dead and he said, I get confused. Now the next part that got me pretty emotional was when Rita was outside crying on the street, you know, in front of the Viper room. And they went to interview her and she said, it's so sad. It just seems like all this time he didn't know that he was dead. I was really, emotionally hit by that statement, but I am so glad that someone said that because so many people, you know, claim it's a demon or it's something dark when they go to investigate. Not always. Most of the time, it is an angry spirit or an angry entity, but they're mad because they don't realize they're dead. And I think that that is a really big important key here as an investigator is, you know, not to forget that if someone dies a faster traumatic death or like River Phoenix in a lucid state of mind, we don't really know what happens, you know, if they black out before they die, can they cross over? How do they cross over? Do they forget to cross over? If they're in a lucid state, can they get help crossing over? We don't really know what causes energies to get trapped here on earth and become earthbound spirits. So I was really compelled by what she said when she said, I can't believe he didn't know that he was dead all this time. So I want you guys to really remember that when you're investigating. That has been something I run into over and over again. When I have ran into actual authentic child spirits, not demonic entities, but actually child spirits, um, most of the time they don't cross over correctly. And I wonder if it's because they wait for their parents, they don't know that they're dead, um, if they were in an abused state before they died, if they're, you know, they feel safer where they're at instead of going to the light or wherever you go when you cross over. So please just keep that in mind. That I think a majority of earthbound spirits have no idea that they're dead. Now I know the next question you're gonna ask is, if I run into an earthbound spirit that doesn't know that they're dead and, and I inform them basically that it's okay to cross over, will they or how can I help them? Well, first of all, I mean, psychics have said that they can do it. I don't know how much I believe a psychic that says or claims they can cross something over. The biggest thing I can tell you guys is you can verbalize it to the entity. You are dead. You are no longer here in your physical self. It's okay to cross over. But the one thing I have learned is that you have to tell the entity, no matter if it's a child or an adult spirit, they have to be the ones that call out and ask for help. 
So whether they're calling to an angel or to the divine or to a spirit guide, they basically run their own free will. Does that make sense? I have learned this from not only some real psychic friends that I know, but they don't cross spirits over. Um, and I've also learned it from some of my friends that practice um, white witchcraft. They all say the same thing, which is you cannot force an energy or an entity to cross over. They have to do it on their own free will. You can help by guiding them, you know, through your voice, telling them they're no longer here, they don't need to stay. If they cross over, they'll go to their friends and family on the other side. You can verbalize that kind of thing. Um, you can even ask your spirit guides or angels or divine to come down and help them. That's still not a guarantee. What I have heard is once you have said this or at least painted them a visual picture that they're no longer here and they can go, then if the opportunity arises, it is their own free will to ask and to be crossed over from help of the other side, whatever energies they may use, whether it's a spirit guide, a family member that's crossed over, an angel or the divine. But they still have the free will to make the decision as an earthbound spirit if they want to stay or go. That is why I don't like it when I hear people say, oh, I'm gonna go cross these people over. It's like, you just, you can't. You can guide them to it. You can help them and inform them. But if they still at the end of the day make the decision to stay, that is their own free will. And honestly, if you use that lesson for everything in life, everybody, even people in your personal life, at work, your family, if someone's not doing something properly in their life, like not taking care of their health. And let's say you have yelled at them, you've got to go to the doctor, you've got to take your medication properly, or you're going to continue to get sick. They already know that. It is their own free will to make the decision to not take care of themselves, to not do certain things. So that's a really big lesson um, I've had to learn personally and professionally, obviously, with working with energies is Every living being, with the exception maybe of animals, because I'm not sure if they can cross themselves over properly, I would still do it the same way. But people, generally speaking, that are earthbound and alive, live their own free will to live their lives the way they choose. Even if it's in the gray zone, and for eternity, you have to accept that. And a great example of that is um, how many psychics and people have we heard go into the Lizzie Borden house and try to force the Bordens to cross over. We know that for sure the parents are still there. We don't know if Lizzie's really there, but people have gone in there trying to force the Bordens to cross over and they won't do it. They, they've told, they've gotten EVPs, they're like, I don't want to, I'm fine here, you know? That is their own free will. They want to stay in their home eternally. They know or may not know they're dead. They may not have accepted that they're dead. And so that's their own free will as an energy to stay in their home forever, for eternity. So try to take that lesson with you, not only as an investigator, but as your day-to-day -day life. So now when Ghost Adventures is getting ready to actually do the investigation, I was shocked when Zach was kind of just doing commentary and telling what was going to happen and what was about to unfold. And all of a sudden we heard that really strong female's voice come through. We didn't really know what it said, but I actually called it out. I was like, oh my God, there's a female voice. And then Zach's like, what was that? So I was so proud that they caught like... That was a DVP, that wasn't even an EVP because that was in real time. So I was really proud of Ghost Adventures for this episode. Zach went down with the SLS cam, captured that really strange figure in the hall that basically didn't want to leave. I think it is so cool that they have switched to the rover cams. So that's the cams that actually are mounted and moved by themselves. Jay probably has some sort of a control center at like home base that he uses to be able to control the cameras. So impressed with those cameras. I want to know what cameras those are because I need to buy them for Ghost Girl Diaries. I even found it compelling that after Zach left the basement and went back down with the other guys and all of a sudden he goes, the energy feels stronger than it did before. 
So that's really crazy when you can actually feel it with your senses, not just using ghost gear. So now they send Aaron in, suited up to go in basically to the hole to find the dirt patch where possibly Anthony Fox has been buried. And who else thought it was so freaking hilarious because I was dying. And then Aaron has the camera like turned around talking, you know, doing like a point of, a point of view shot, POV shot. And his like glasses are fogged up. Probably he was just probably sweating and like really stressed. And it was probably like really humid, you know, down in the dirt where they were. I was dying laughing. I thought it was so freaking hilarious. And then they had the counter for like how many complaints he had. And he's like, I can't, I can't do this. So this is just total proof that yes, we love ghost adventures for their evidence and for their history and for the locations that they go to, but even more that we love them as their own characters, even though they technically play themselves, we love them for the characters that they are. Not only were Aaron's glasses fogged up, but it made his eyes look like magnified and it just it looked so funny like ugh. and I was really thought it was great and impressive that Zach's like pushing him through the walkie like just keep going Aaron and Aaron finally snapped back He was like then you come down here and do it then I was like damn like he's like he's over Zach like bossing him around I thought it was pretty good you go Aaron good job you keep that up god and then the poor dude is like crawling through like glass and metal rods and like all that stuff he says his knees are getting cut up and then he's looking for the mel meter and like the psb7 he said he thought he lost the walkie talkie and he says that everything was in his pants and he can't find it and then he gets concerned that he looks like he's playing with himself on national television Aaron, it's a good thing that we just love you for who you are. I don't know where the ghost gear is. It's all in my pants. I think I lost it. Now, Billy uses this like ITC kind of experimental thing that is, it looks like it could have been built by Bill Chapel, right? With the imaging on the wall. And I saw the face when it first popped up, the one kind of image that they had. I think that they need to use it more frequently so that we as investigators can kind of get used to the way it looks and how to look for that actual evidence when it pops up. I did find it really compelling that they had had it on for a while and not another single image popped up on the wall. At first, I did want to say that it was matrixing, but then Zach had announced that they had had it on for 30 minutes and not another image popped up other than kind of like the blurry background. So that made it even more compelling to possibly be an actual piece of evidence that they captured. So I was really impressed with that. So then at the end, they take the paranormal puck and they ask Anthony Fox, you know, who killed you? And his answer was, won't. Maybe his friends were involved with his disappearance Maybe they had to blame, you know, for the theft of the money disappearing, money laundering, basically. They had to blame it on someone um, to end it with the mobsters. And they pointed the finger at Anthony. And he kind of took the fall for it in order for Johnny Depp and the other owner to kind of get out from underneath this huge kind of mobster, gangster money laundering issue that they had going on in the 90s. So I thought it was really crazy that even in death, someone will still keep a secret. So then the very last piece of evidence that Ghost Adventures handed to us was one single guitar note being played on stage, which I also thought was compelling because you saw in the camera, no one was on the stage. And once again, if you think about electrical equipment, even with music and you know drums, guitar, keyboards, piano, how many times have we heard of entities like in the Stanley Hotel playing the piano? Now we hear a guitar note being played. This episode of Ghost Adventures was not packed full of evidence, right? Like we're used to seeing a lot of stuff with evidence with Ghost Adventures. Every once in a while, we won't see that. This was more of a historical run. This was more about the characters, like showing a lot of footage of Aaron really struggling in the basement. But this, once again, is the time more than ever for everyone that is out there that has a show to be authentic and be real because that is when we respect you. 
we as an audience would rather not see any evidence at all than see faked evidence. And I feel like this is a lesson of showing Ghost Adventures did not get very much evidence, but they still delivered with a story, a beginning, middle, and an end, um, showing characters, giving us a historical run, giving us eyewitnesses, giving us video footage of the club and of actual portals that could be open inside of the Viper Room, and I thought it was a great episode. I thought it was probably one of the best episodes of Ghost Adventures, just because I like that they didn't catch a lot of evidence and they were honest about it. What did you guys think about the episode of the Viper Room? I loved it, now I'd actually love to go to Sunset and just go have a drink at the Viper Room one night to see what it's like. Tomorrow I will be posting a new vlog about near-death experiences. I'll be sharing a personal story of my life to um, kind of get you guys with your brains clicking with critical thinking and why near-death experiences could be related to the other side and communication. Make sure you guys give my video a thumbs up. Make sure you've subscribed to my channel if you haven't already. Make sure you guys follow me on social media and I will catch you guys next time.